So uh, I realize that's on. Can we okay? I realize we're in Washington D.C. and uh, I've been told in the past that I can be a little polarizing. I can even be a little bit political. And uh, at the chance of uh, the chance of being both here, I thought I'd just start by saying uh, it's awesome to see this digital preservation uh, society get together and talk about this. When I think about data and I think about access to data. I think it's important for all of us to understand the time to get to that data. Uh, Barry and I were talking a little earlier about, uh, about the knowledge economy, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but if you, uh, if, if you were out, uh, most of you probably weren't, but if anybody was listening to Mark Zuckerberg over the past six, seven months, he talks a lot about the knowledge economy, and it's now estimated that Facebook can predict a flu pan pandemic faster than the CDC based on data. And speed to that data is critically important. So please support your Congress people to support reclassifying ISPs as type two common carriers and reclassifying the internet as a utility, because that's what it is. So that being said, I'm Cole Crawford. Do you guys hear a buzz? Maybe I'm gonna switch this podium because it's crazy. I think it's the house speaker. Okay. Is it really the house speaker? Might be these. Uh, it's driving me nuts, though. Um, I'm no stranger to the government. I, uh, I've had the opportunity and the, the pleasure of briefing Vivek Kundra, who is the former CIO of the US, Anish Chobra, who's the CTO of the White House, on a number of various cloud related industries, hardware related technologies, etc. Um, I did work with NASA very closely prior to Rackspace getting involved on OpenStack. And just, just so I know sort of how technical this crowd is, um, who here is familiar with OpenStack? So a lot of you. There's a huge storage aspect to OpenStack, and as we start consuming storage as a service, uh, I think that's going to be uh, a technology that we'll be using a lot in the future. Um, and I was the founding storage project chair for Open Compute. So back in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, I did a lot with the XFS file system uh, for Linux. So I care a lot about uh, data integrity and how you access data. So who's heard of the Open Compute Project and what we do? So not a lot of people. I noticed earlier in, uh, in one of the previous presentations a LAMP stack link at the bottom, or it was a, there was a reference to LAMP. And if you don't know, LAMP stands for Linux Apache, uh, MySQL, and either Python, Perl, uh, a couple of other programming languages, PHP. Um, and those are open source technologies that uh, that are allowing anybody, governments, people, corporations, etc., to take advantage of community-based innovation. If we were to go and work in silos and recreate all of this technology time and time again, the pace of innovation that we see in the industry would not be what we're seeing today. So I'm really happy that, that there was a lot of community-focused um, questions uh, with the panel discussion that was up here uh, a couple hours ago because community is important. And uh, open compute is no different from these big software-related open source technologies. We're an open source hardware 501c6 nonprofit. We've got about 35, 3,600, I know the slide said 33, but we've got about 35, 3,600 contributing members now that work on the project. Uh, we have a huge amount of, of corporate support. We've got more than 150 corporate members that are supporting the project. Um, and these are these are big corporations. If you look at some of these slides, um, you you know you'll see companies like Facebook, HGST, uh, lots of storage related companies. Uh, more you know more more, more ODMs. Uh, Rackspace is one of the co-founders of, of Open Compute. Um, we just have our yearly summit in January in Silicon Valley, and and if, I don't know if anybody saw uh, that was familiar with Open previous to, to me speaking today, but Microsoft came out and said all of Azure's infrastructure is now going to be converted to open compute. And if you think about hyperscale, and if you think about um, how much data is going to be out in the world, it's cool to see a company like Microsoft with their entire cloud platform being built on hardware that now anybody can go and uh, repurpose and reuse and not have to reinvent that wheel. So it's very cool to see big companies like Microsoft and Panasonic and Fox and Yandex and Russia 
uh, working with us. So we're not just US based. We are an international based open source project. We have a number of different chapters around the globe that all have specific charters. If we look at the US and what's important to us in the US in terms of um, strategic technology and the value that that brings geographically, it probably and is very different than say Japan. So we were over in Japan just a couple uh, a couple months back, and the the, the Japanese uh, project had a big presentation that they were doing, and some of the schools got involved, and they were working on uh, an innovation that recreated sort of the data center that that Facebook uses in Primeville, but built the the floor on a moving floor because of seismic activity. So that's not something that would generally be something that the U.S. would unless you're in LA maybe. Um, but you know, for the most part, um, our, our technology requirements geographically are very different. So having environmentally aware, open innovations that are repeatable, reusable, is, is very cool. And like LAMP, like Linux, you can repurpose and you can refactor uh, and reuse these, these sort of technologies for yourself. So we run these, uh, we run these global events we have a number of engineering workshops. In fact, just yesterday, we launched HPC, High Performance Computing, as a top-level project for the foundation, and we kicked that off at the University of New Hampshire. Um, the University of New Hampshire runs this uh, IOL lab, this uh, interoperability lab, and it's really quite amazing to see what universities and uh, academia are doing with standards organizations. I think the question was brought up a little earlier about about standards and the need for standards. And it's great when companies get together and say, okay, we created this standard and now here's this technology and it's gonna cost you this much money. It's well and good, it certainly does allow you to create a standard, but it's not a community-based standard. It's not something that was asked for, it was something that was pushed on you. So um, it's important, I guess, for us, the mission of Open Compute, to drive community-based standards forward, not, not consortium-based standards. And we're, we're, it's, a, it's a key differentiator for us. We are a community-focused foundation. I don't know if you guys can read this, but uh, we've got some very big heavy hitters on the board of directors for Open Compute. We've got guys like Andy Bechtelsheim. Uh, and if you don't know who Andy Bechtelsheim is, he's the guy who wrote the check to Larry and Sergey to go start up Google. He was the first $100,000 investor in this company. He's on the board of directors. Uh, we've got Frank Minkowski, who is the Senior Vice President of Supply Chain and Hardware Optimization at Facebook. He was sort of the, the, the founder and father of Open Compute. Uh, we've got um, Don Duet, who's a partner at Goldman Sachs. We've got uh, Mark Rennick, who's the Chief Operating Officer of Rackspace. So we have a very powerful board of directors that could influence direction. But if you look at the way that the foundation is focused, it's community-led. The touch point into the community is all the project levels you see below, and we'll get into these projects here in a second, but we run a very flat organization. We've got two community managers. We've got um, somebody focused on certification. The stuff you put in your data center, you want to make sure that it works, uh, it doesn't burn it down, so data gets preserved, um, and, uh, and myself. So the projects we, we govern are server, storage, networking, uh, we've got uh, data center design, uh, HPC, certification, open rack, and I'm missing one. Um, okay, server. Uh, so today we'll talk a little bit about storage as being uh, kind of storage focused. But these are, the, these are the technologies we govern. So each one of these technologies has a project lead that interfaces with the community, uh, with the ecosystem, and is there to really not just get you to participate, but get you to you know get you to be involved on on both the uh, the outgoing but also the incoming technologies of the foundation. So, any Lois Lowry fans here? There's a there's a there's a movie coming out. And there's a book written in the '90s called The Giver, and uh, it's a really good book. When I was a kid, I really liked that book. Um, and she was just doing an interview about things coming to life when you ask what if. She was talking about uh, character development and people uh, in, the, in the book and how she sort of writes. And I, it, that really sort of resonated with me. You know, what if we redesigned the entire data center? 
What if we started from scratch? The, I'll talk about it on the next slide. But we were, uh, we were sort of forced into using the traditional 19-inch raft that everybody uses. How many people here have actually stepped foot in a data center? Oh, gosh. Wow. OK. <laughs> um, that's awesome. So, uh, so your typical 19-inch rack, you probably don't know, but the typical 19-inch rack came out of the railroad switching era. So that was what, that's what people in the early 1900s were using to put railroad switching gear in. Then it was adopted by the music industry, and then it was adopted by information technology. This is a true fact. I'm not making it up. Um, so we were forced into this form factor that, you know, yeah, it made sense for a little while, but uh, it didn't necessarily allow us to innovate very, very much, and it certainly did allow us to operate with the, with the most efficiency possible. So Facebook, who was sort of the, the grandfather of, from a corporation perspective of open compute, they were, they were very locked in. I mean, you can, imagine, um, you can imagine the size of the database, the data warehouse in the back end of Facebook. It's, it's gigantic, and we'll get into some data points on those numbers here in a second. But, they were having to multi-source from multiple tier ones. So you have your, your obvious uh, top level tier ones that they were buying hardware from. And in those tier ones, differentiation took place. You had companies that were changing plastic to power a motherboard. You had different power supplies with different protocols. You had um, out-of-band management capabilities that allowed you to do very cool things. I don't, I don't I don't know that I've actually mounted a virtual CD-ROM on a remote computer in a decade, but this, this firmware and these differentiated hardware offerings and these tier ones allow you to do that. They just do that in different ways. Um, so Facebook went back to the drawing board and said, what if we did all of these things? And again, when you use Facebook, chances are you're either telling something about something or you're uploading a photo or sharing something that's been uploaded. Um, so it's very... It's very eyeball hungry, which means there's a lot of graphics, there's a lot of text, there's a lot of content stored in the database somewhere. And that means on the back end, a massive amount of drives. There's just an insane number of drives. And I think, I think the other huge database, I mean, there's several out there. GE has a, a massive database. But the, the Library of Congress obviously has a, the National Archives have a, a huge database as well. So Facebook went back to China. Uh, worked with the Chinese uh, ODMs directly, and they, they were able to create an open source motherboard, an open source chassis, an open source power supply, and then they sole sourced from everybody. It didn't matter who built it, it was identical, so they could take it, they could repurpose it. And if you've, uh, if you've listened to anybody speak at Open Compute about Facebook's infrastructure, there's, there's not a lot of SKUs, so there's very, a very small number of SKUs that they use from their web servers to their storage servers to their min cache, et cetera. Um, so, but obviously the, the data center techs that walk those data centers and look for um, you know, bad drives, I mean, data durability is something that we all care about. So um, you know, making sure that the right erasure coding is in place or the right replication algorithm is in place, there's a lot of hardware techs that are walking up and down looking for bad drives to make sure that, uh, that they can access those drives fix those drives or replace those drives. So uh, part of what Facebook did was introduce this box called Knox, K-N-O-X. And Knox is a two tray, it's the upper left hand image up there. It's a two tray, 30 drive uh, storage, you know, JBOD that is on garage door hinges. Literally, it's a garage door hinges. So you could pull it out and then you could, you could pull it down 45 degrees and it would support the weight of the drive. Uh, and talking about innovation and, and you know trial and error, the first iteration of this box, all the drives spun the same way, which torqued the rack, <laughs> which allowed the chassis not couldn't get the thing back out. Uh, so more innovation, right? They put the low the lower tray with the drive spinning this way and the upper tray with the drive spinning this way, uh, no problems. Um, and they made the um, they made the access to the drives completely toolless. So now you could just pop it up, pull it out replace it, and you're done. They got rid of the, uh, the traditional PDU. They stopped using AC power. We can talk a little bit about that. But one of the most interesting things that they've done more recently, uh, Jay Parikh at Facebook was at the summit in January talking about data archiving uh, and cold storage. How many people here care about cold storage? There's, yeah, everybody. Um, tape archive is 
traditionally been the standard for cold storage, uh, or extremely deep cold storage. Um, Jay at the Open Compute Summit in January talked about Facebook's 10,000 Blu-ray disc cold archive replacement which is an 80% power savings, a 50% capex savings, um, and 10,000 of these drives equal about one petabyte right now. So imagine being able to integrate that technology into Linux technology like the, like the TAR command, which actually is, is uh, short for tape archive. And you've got a really robust, deep, cold storage uh, access platform. So that's, that's really cool. The other thing that they did was think about the data center itself and the power they were consuming. Um, I'm going to use a metric here called PUE. Uh, does anybody understand power utilization effectiveness? So this is a term that this is the sort of the, the de facto standard in operating, or excuse me, in measuring data center efficiency. And it's estimated that about 10%, 10 to 15% of all of the US's data consumption is coming out of data centers. If you think about that, that's a lot of coal burned. It's a lot of coal burned. Uh, and so the 1.9 PUE basically means that for every dollar you're spending on, uh, or for every cent you're spending on delivering a watt to that server, you're spending nine cents on overhead just getting the power there, which is a fairly inefficient number. Um, your typical, your typical uh, power path to the server is from the wire. It goes through a, it goes through a transformation from AC, uh, excuse me, from DC to AC back to DC. Uh, then it goes to a PDU, and you finally end up with uh, uh, with power to your to your dual power supply box on you know in the rack. Facebook said, "What if we took power directly from the wire? So high voltage, right?" But if we took high voltage, 470, converted it to 270, um, did no uh, did no no cooling. So so Prineville has a, a, a couple of uh, they use swamp cooling effectively, um, and they use this water vapor. More trial and error stuff there about how they cooled that and how some metals rust. Um, <laughs> but uh, they figured it out, and uh, Prineville has been very very. Um, a very good data center for them. Uh, Prineville, I think that the number's been about 1.07, so delivering 0 0.07 cents for every penny spent on a, a computing watt, which is really efficient. There's a, another data center in Europe, uh, north in, in Ulia, Sweden, and it's at 1.03. So and the magic number for this world is, is 1.0. Um, so we kind of talked a little bit about the push versus pull uh, process of community versus vendor initiated um, innovation. And so we deliver in kind of a different way. It's up to our community to determine what it wants before our solution providers get involved. So while our solution providers can, um, can certainly play a role with the community aspect at the project level, we want to make sure that the right technologies we're giving to the consumers as fast as possible. Um, but I'm going to skip over this because I think how am I doing on the time? About five minutes. Okay. Let's go. Let's let's skip forward then here a lot. Oh, I can't see anything. Uh, I actually, I really messed up because I can't see anything. Uh, let me just let me just pull forward here. And I want to talk about this. All right, so in 2012, we had about 0.8 zettabytes of data. There we go. Um, in, uh, sorry, 2010, 0.8. 2012, we had just under three zettabytes. By 2020, it's estimated that the world's going to have about 40 zettabytes of data. And that doesn't mean a lot to me or you, maybe, but to offer some perspective, that's every every byte is that's uh, if you take one single byte, that's 50 times sorry 57 times the amount of grains of sand on the earth. Uh, if you take those disks and you run those disks 
around the moon, in fact. That's one and a half round trips to the moon. That's the requirement we're going to need. It's estimated that China alone and wearables, just smart watches and the things that you wear, is going to um, be responsible for roughly 10 zettabytes of data by 10, 2025, just off of wearables in China alone. So we have a data problem. Uh, we don't need, you know, it's not, we, we have a physical data problem, not, not even an access problem. Uh, we don't need six terabyte drives, which are assumed to be here sometime in 2015, 2016. We need 60 terabyte drives. So it's up to the communities to sort of drive this type of innovation. We are working with, uh, with big companies like Seagate, other tier one drive manufacturers on cool new ways to access data so we can at least get more dense vertically. Kinetic is one of the interfaces that has been given to the, excuse me, the foundation. We work with companies like uh, Fusion IO on OpenNVM, which allows you to access data quicker so you can do uh, faster real-time analytics. Um, and cold storage is obviously one of the, one of the places that's, that's very strategic for us. Um, I have a huge amount of, of passion for it. I have like two minutes left, and I've got a few more slides, but I'm going to ignore them. I know there were questions around communities, so um, let's just take this time to answer maybe two or three questions around what we're doing or, or you know, how you guys can play a role. Um, so, questions. Oh, is that boring? <laughs> <laughs> All right. What kind of role would you like us to play? Fair enough. Um, <laughs> You know, I think as, as stewards of, of digital data, um, you guys could be working with the project uh, directly on, on your requirements. If there are workloads that are, that are important to you, let us help you on the procurement side of that, because we can be a great engine for procurement. Um, as, you need, um, as you need more space in your data center, as you need more access to content, you can get that. We we run an open, we run a, a, a working group right now for the telco industry on a specific reference architecture. Um, so a, you know the, the a community of one is still a very small community, but a community of you know a thousand is a is a is a big voice. Um, so it was it was asked earlier. It's funny that you guys had all these community questions for that panel discussion. I, I wanted to be on stage, um, but uh, use us and 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 you know I guess the last thing I'll say is there's a level of trust in communities. I, I remember um, the woman saying something about shipping MD5 checksums with every file. You know the government actually is moving away from that sort of um, access. There's there's verified. Receipt, and that's, I mean, two-phase authentication is obviously very important, um, but they've moved away from your typical common criteria, evaluation assurance level two and four, and uh, common, you know, the fifth one forty dash two, uh, to special publication 800-53, and I, you know, I know this may not make any sense to you guys, but this turned into FedRAMP, which is a, a authorization and accreditation program that the government operates for, secure cloud. So uh, it's, it's a good idea to verify, but, but trust and verify. Uh, other than that, thank you for your time. <laughs>